Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it's Renald again, uh, back with another portfolio update. Uh, today is October 1st, 2021. Obviously, the crypto numbers especially have already changed since I made the thumbnail. Um, but uh, today we're going to go over, once again, the stock portfolio a little bit. We're not going to mention Robinhood too much. I haven't done a whole lot with that lately. I still hold like around around $800 at this point, Ethereum Classic, uh, mainly less Doge, um, and uh, more of Palantir and another company, Snow. Uh, we'll get into that later. Um, but today we'll mainly focus on the M1 Finance and Coinbase again, mostly on Coinbase. We're mostly going to talk about um, cryptocurrency and stuff this time as well. Um, one thing you're immediately going to notice on this uh, first screen that we're looking at right now uh, is just that I have way less right now, right, in the, in the M1 Finance. And actually, if you look at my progress, it was actually going really, really well. And then you see this massive dump right here. Why did that happen? Uh, because I didn't follow all of my own advice. And this is something that everyone at home should definitely take care not to allow to happen to them. So this was more because of my lack of an emergency fund. I actually had to sell these ac assets um, in between residency and employment. Um, you know, whenever there's slight uh, changes, deviations from the way you thought things would go. Remember, these unexpected expenses are always a possibility. Uh, and so, you know, this really illustrates the, the uh, importance of keeping some money in reserve as like an emergency fund. In this case, I really only needed like a month, a month or two of money uh, saved up and it would have been fine. Now, thankfully, I actually had that money, um, but less good is the fact that I had to actually pay, you know, uh, not only sell these assets, at come tax time, I'm going to have to pay, uh, you know, taxes on those uh, assets because I set, sold mostly for, as you can see through my percent return, I sold mostly for, you know, gain. That's gain. And I believe with, uh, you know, having started May 28th, um, I guess I would get just that, that, that better capital gains tax rate. Um, I'm just over one year, so that, that should be okay. Um, but you know, it would be better not to pay any taxes on it at all. Um, so as you can see, I'm kind of, now that I have my job and you know, I'm kind of back with the income, I am DCAing right back in pretty quickly. And you know, within the next month or two, I should be back to where I was and probably a little bit past that. Um, at this point I've gotten $185 total in dividends. Super happy about that. Remember, that's one of the emphases of my, my portfolio. Um, I'm really heavy on certain, you know, uh, dividend generating, uh, you know, stocks and ETFs. Uh, so that's been kind of a, a big thing for me. I've maintained that kind of focus, um, but I have kind of re rejiggered my, my percentages a little bit so that um, to be just a little bit more conservative, I guess. At this point, now that I'm leaning a bit more heavily into crypto, uh, stock market stuff is a little bit of a backseat. Um, but I, I, I think of it more as the, I guess, more stable part of my portfolio, which is hilarious because, you know, in the world of investing, yeah, straight up stocks and, you know, including individual stocks that I've kind of included in here, it's considered more of a risky type of investment. But getting into crypto definitely modulates your risk tolerance. Let's put it that way. Um, like today, Bitcoin, I will go over this in just a second, but Bitcoin went up 10% today. In the past couple of days, there were all these huge dumps uh, right before that. And so you get used to a way bigger amount of uh, variation, volatility. If you look at this, I mean, day to day, week to week, a lot of the gain here is from me DCAing in. There's positive fluctuation in real market gains and dividends, uh, other than dividends, but ultimately, you know, this is a slow, steady gain. You see what I'm saying? Um, and as we'll see here, I mean, there's there's a lot of kind of, there's sideways action for sure. But if you were to zoom into all of this stuff, um, you'd you'd see that there's there's a lot more day-to-day -day variation. I mean, look look at this, right? I was apparently at like 19.5 earlier. Then I went all the way down to 19.3. And, you know, throughout the, the weeks and the months, it's just way more volatility. You expect a lot more of that with um, cryptocurrency. Um, but, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot more into these ETFs. I've switched up my heavier SRET holdings down to, um, you know, VNQ. Um, and it's kind of that's that's I've kind of diversified my ETF real estate exposure for, for the REIT market. 
Um, still bullish on a lot of the same companies I was last time I, I, I had a portfolio reveal. Um, I'm still using Jeppy as kind of a, a consistent uh, income source alongside Realty Income and of course uh, SPHD um, that are monthly dividend payers. Um, but actually WP Carry has really been outperforming as far as dividends from REITs. They've been doing really, really well. And I anticipate that they're going to end up doing even better over the years as they then become a dividend aristocrat. And that immediately you know, includes them in stuff like Noble um, and <clears throat> helps their trading volume and usually uh, supplements a company's price at that time as well. So not a lot to say here except don't you know make my mistake just you know go ahead and always make sure you have a emergency fund even if it seems like you can get away with it not having one yeah, you know try your best to get one um <clears throat> moving on like i said we're going to spend a lot more time on the crypto side of this we're going to go over individual ones of my uh, heaviest convictions um and then kind of see like what what i'm thinking about that so uh, at the moment, let's see if this is updated. 193, um, yeah, about 193. Um, so it looks like we're still we're still dealing with that. That's that's good. Um, so yesterday we were at about, I think it was 1700 for for a while, 1700 ish for a while, and then overnight it went up to 19. Why is that? So looking at my breakdowns at, at this point, um, Ethereum. Uh, is up about 10% alongside BTC. BTC really uh, kind of um, surged today. It was, it was really interesting because um, BTC had been a little weak for a while. You see all this sideways, well, that's the 24 hour chart, but for the last month or so, I mean, if anything, it's gone down a bit. It's traded sideways a lot, um, but we've seen a huge surge. And even in like, you know, in the last, I think it was even, yeah, yeah, right here, right here. Literally within minutes, it, it kind of surged thousands of dollars. It was very impressive. Um, so a lot of the market rise today has been driven by BTC. But, but if you look at um, <clears throat> BTC dominance, BTC dominance has actually gone up at this point. Um, it's, it's kind of, uh, kind of been performing really well. Um, BTC has been pulling away a bit more. Ethereum up to 3,200. So we were sub 3,000 for a little while there, um, but we're we're really recovering well from that. So so that's going to be a big part of this rise. Algorand has been performing like crazy lately, and we'll go into why that you know the factors behind that as well. Um, but right now it's only 174. But more recently, I mean, it's gone as high as 255, which is not an all-time high. It's an all-time recent, it's not, it's a recent time high, but it's not an all-time high. It's all-time high was around um, when it actually first came out. Um, uh, this actually doesn't, I don't believe this actually goes all the way back there, but it used to be much higher. Um, anyway, going back to the assets, DAI. So if you, we may as well just do the stable coin part of this right now. So I, I you didn't have any stable coins in my, in my uh, portfolio before, that has changed. Um, basically, there's two here, right? There's USDC and there's DAI. The way I kind of use that and think about it, USDC has a 0.15% uh, APY interest uh, on Coinbase. So I use USDC more as my buy the dip fund. It started off almost at 1,000. Uh, it's down to 300. I bought a couple dips on a couple of coins at this point because like I said, there have been a couple of dips recently. Um, and then as far as DAI, uh, that is the highest percent APY interest uh, on, on Coinbase. I'm a fan of it. Um, so so I am kind of using this as kind of more of just a reserve of money. Uh, that's more stable savings that I don't pull from at all, basically. I haven't touched this. If I hadn't touched my USDC during the same time I started investing in DAI, I would also have about $1,500 in both. So that's, I'm doing roughly equal DCA into both. Um, and then, as you can see, I've gotten a lot heavier into Solana, a lot heavier into Solana. They've been doing ridiculously well. Their ecosystem has really picked up. And so I believe a bit more in their fundamentals. We'll talk about that more in just a second. Um, Axie Infinity, holy Jesus, wow. 44% today. Today. Oh my God, I didn't even read. It was 30% last I checked. To put that into perspective, this is just today. It went up another 10% since I last checked before I started recording. Axie Infinity is going crazy. That's nuts. 
Um, Polygon is so starting to have their time in the sun that I was looking forward to. Okay, so the whole market has actually gone up a good bit since I last checked. And you, you'll see that I have a couple smaller app. I got into, I got into Shiba. I got into uh, Engine a little bit. Uh, I'll make a separate video about these weaker convictions that I have. Uh, some of these are really good coins. Like for instance, Basic Attention Token, if you look at my interface that I'm filming or I'm using right now, I've used transition, I've transitioned over to using Brave Browser primarily. Um, you know, I'm not going to say too much about things like Shiba, Stellar, Tezos, Polkadot. Polkadot is a really good project, but we won't go into detail right now. We'll do a different video for that. But basic attention token, just real quick. Uh, big fan of them. They offer real world value. As I was saying in my initial cryptocurrency video, I mean, these people have a browser, right? This browser that you're seeing right here, we're using a lot of the same tools that Chrome has. Um, it is the fastest browser. It's benchmarked faster than Firefox, Safari, etc. Everything. It's better than everything. And if I go to like YouTube or something, one thing that you'll notice is there's no upfront ads here, right? Like it automatically blocks those ads. It's, it's really good. Um, not to mention that it, it doesn't collect your information. You, you have to, you know, okay everything. It has a built-in ad block. Um, it has crypto wallet technology and integration uh, you know, built in once again. And then it even has new private window with Tor. So if you really want private, uh, like private, private, like can't identify you private, they have that support built into the browser as well. So this is, in my opinion, head and shoulders above every other browser available, essentially. And there's that integration of blockchain technology and even token rewards inside the browser. You can tip from in, inside the browser. You can, um, you know, watch ads for pay. That's another feature of Brave Browser and Basic Attention Token. No, they're not sponsoring this video, but goddamn, I wish they would. I do believe in them a good bit. I just haven't put as much money into them. I may in the future, um, just because of their utility. I really like them. Um, but we're just gonna go ahead and go down the list here, uh, all the way down to about Wrapped Luna. Um, really more seriously all the way down to Polygon, and then we'll mention a little bit about Terra and Luna at the very end. Um, so we may as well start with Ethereum. Obviously the big bullish news for Ethereum is, you know, ETH 2.0. Beacon Chain came out months ago. We haven't actually been able to use, use the Beacon Chain, but obviously now the Ethereum mainnet is uh, slated to, um, you know, uh, merge um, with the Beacon Chain. So that would allow the transition fully to proof of stake you know, so from proof of work to proof of stake. Um, and then later, shard chains will be introduced. So there will be a real supplement to scaling and TPS, like big time with just the beacon chain and merge, which should be soon. We'll go over that in a second. Um, but then exponentially more with the introduction of shard chaining once we complete the rollout of Ethereum 2.2 or 2.0. So when's it shipping? Q1, Q2, 2022 is what they say. They were thinking about actually moving this all the way up to December, so Q4, 2021. That's still a possibility. That's something they're kicking around because apparently development has actually gone really, really well on ETH 2.0. I mean, whatever. Um, so sustainability, obviously, we're really about the green stuff in eco, which or in uh, crypto, which is great. I don't get me wrong. I really support that. I think that's really important. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, like. They have all this FUD about, you know, uh, sustainability and stuff regarding crypto, but at the same time, the legacy system is using way more energy, way more energy. But, you know, all the FUD with us, you know, with crypto is, is you know, like, oh, we're using too much. It's a fraction of what the legacy system, financial world uses right now. So it just seems a little hypocritical, but I, mean, I am glad that we're getting this out of the way now. Because if it wasn't now, it would be later 100%. Proof of work would eventually uh, give you un unreasonable energy requirements, honestly, going forward. Um, but uh, yeah, so so pretty much uh, the merge is coming up soon. I'm really excited about that. Uh, that should reduce Ethereum network, you know, gas fees a lot. Uh, and I think the combination of EIP 1559 has, which has, as I showed in one of my shorts, in terms of volatility and, and stuff like that, um, EIP 1559 is working. We've burned, you know, a crap ton of ETH 
a bunch of money in and tokens have been have been burned at this point. And once we pick up the actual TPS and we can process more transactions, burn even more, um, I think that's going to be amazing for price action. Um, so that's the big thing coming up with uh, Ethereum 2.0. We're waiting on that. Um, and, and all the same, just Ethereum even without that uh, at this point. By the way, ETH 2.0, you can stake on Coinbase uh, with a single press of a button. Very convenient. Um, oh, and uh, that's another thing that obviously proof of stake is going to bring is Ethereum staking. Um, and so there's a rising amount of money locked into Ethereum 2.0 staking, which directly relates to staking rewards. So one thing that you probably may have seen if you're looking into Ethereum staking is just that um, the staking reward initially is like 21%. So you might look at that and think, okay, so you're getting 5% on, on ETH 2.0 staking on Coinbase. That's like a big, like 15, 16%. Um, you know, difference there. You're missing out on a lot. Well, right now, yes. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That's true. Um, but long term, the way that works is that as more money gets locked up with the staking, um, you kind of, uh, the staking reward goes down. And actually, it shouldn't, we should definitely get to a point where staking rewards are less than 4%, um, or less than 5%. Um, I think the Ethereum definitely has that potential as if, uh, staking gets really uh, popular. Uh, I think, you know, it'll go the way of Cardano where we have this dramatic upward trend towards staking. Um, uh, and because there's that 32 ETH floor on how much you can stake as an individual entity, I think obviously staking pools are going to be a big, uh, a big deal to maintain the decentralization of the network as, as, as possible. Um, but, you know, ETH has been doing really well lately. ETH has been doing really well lately. We still have that same all-time high of 4,300. A lot of people are saying 10K plus this cycle. I think that's easy, easy. Once we see Bitcoin start to really rally uh, and go up a lot, I think um, I think that's easy. That's that's not, that's a no-brainer. I think that's, that's probably going to be much more than that. So exciting news for Ethereum. Um, there's a couple of other things we're going to go over, obviously, as you can see. Um, so next thing is going to be Bitcoin, the man, the myth, the legend, the big daddy, the most, you know, the important market mover. Um, so Bitcoin, um, as I was saying earlier, uh, had a huge jump, literally within like minutes, as I was pointing out. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on with Bitcoin. I mean, there's El Salvador making it legal tender the day of that uh, El Salvador rolled that out. Not a lot of price action. Uh, if anything, it actually went down a bit. Their, President Bukele kind of blamed the IMF. He just kind of like uh, tweeted out with a little wink um, that you know it was probably manipulated and it was probably gonna benefit uh, El Salvador long term. Uh, I think that's true. I think that's probably right. Um, but uh, you know, short term, there's actually been a bit of unrest in the country um, just because there's the the uh, perception that you can, you know, get paid, but then the money, the price of Bitcoin goes down, and then you have way less money, or 90% less money if it's crypto winter kind of thing. Uh, and there's a lot of concern about the instability of uh, the price of Bitcoin. Um, but you got to realize, like, you know, not that long ago. So right now we're at 48,000. Holy shit, that's awesome. Uh, just, you know, in these massive moves, we were like, you know, at the start of the day, like when we had 40, 43,000, we've already gone up $5,000 in one day. But that's part of the volatility that concerns people as using it as legal tender because they feel that they're required to accept this payment, otherwise pay a fee. So it's kind of a requirement. They say it's optional, but there's a fee. There's a tax on, on not accepting it as legal tender. Um, at least that's what I'm told. I'm going to have to recheck in on that. But, you know, remember, don't forget that earlier on this year, we were, we were, you know, we started off the year um, kind of where, you know, like 33,000. We've still come up a lot since then. You can, you definitely had a bigger all time high um, at around that 60,000 range. Um, but, you know, we, we have a ways to go, I think, with this cycle. There's been a lot of manipulation lately is the other thing. I think I think there have been a lot of uh, times where you see these sudden price movements, especially there have been times where like you see Bitcoin and Solana go up or down in large parts, like large volatility, um, pretty uh, it, with weird 
synchronization type stuff. Uh, Algorand is the other thing that is actually really big from El Salvador that kind of um, kind of plays into this a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think long term Algorand is, is pretty darn bullish. They just came out with the Algorand uh, virtual machine to upgrade their smart contract capabilities. Um, they are some of the more advanced um, kind of technology in the, in the blockchain space right now. Um, so, you know, I think going forward, they, they have a really great team behind them. They're really focused on like CBDC plays and really big institutional and even government level plays. Um, so I think they have that behind them. I think um, the reason that they haven't, you know, gotten much headlines just yet um, is, is just because they don't market directly to consumers. They aren't as worried about what you or me thinks on a day-to-day -day basis. They're worried about talking directly to companies. Um, so, you know, they're doing that. They're doing a great job on that. And then their big CBDC play, they just announced that a while ago that, um, you know, they got 16 CBDCs pending. They're working on them. Um, you know, Algorand. Algorand has a lot going forward, you know. I'm really excited about them. Uh, El Salvador, like I was saying, has uh, announced that they're going to be, um, you know, adopting Algorand as the um, as the blockchain layer one that they're going to build their crypto uh, infrastructure on. And so, you know, from a, from an institutional and country perspective, Algorand has a lot going for it. Even if Algorand doesn't become a chain that was like. You know, they have a huge NFT space. They have a lot of, you know, consumer accessible type of stuff. But even if it doesn't become regularly used by like regular retail investors, I don't think they care that much. I don't think it matters that much to their business model. Um, Algorand just has, um, you know, they're really into just getting these big institutions. And I think that's probably going to be good for long term price stability, um, just because if you're really working with countries and, and stuff like that, you're probably going to end up long term with enough, you know, money behind your, your market cap where you have less volatility is, is the idea or is the hope anyway. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is really going up and that's really helping the entire model market right now. Um, so, you know, next up is going to be just Solana. Solana is, you know, Solana is Solana. Solana, look, look at Solana's price action. This is the craziest shit that's ever happened, ever. Like, look, look at this. Look, look, look at this, right? Look at that. Holy crap. This is just since July. July, it was $23. Can you imagine, right? And then it ran up hard to an all-time high of 214. I mean, people that got in any time earlier this year. I mean, my God, we started the year off at $3, right? $3. Right now, we're, we're, we're looking at a run-up this year that is comparable. I mean, this is 100x just this year. It's like comparable to the Ethereum run-up a couple of years ago. This is really impressive. And it's not just a matter of price action. Solana is not just another pretty face. Um, you know, it's it's got massive fundamentals. Let's go over some of those fundamentals right now. Okay, so going into Solana, fun, like, like what's going on with it. So one thing that I would really emphasize personally, in my view, I think adoption in terms of a long-term fundamentals view is super, super important. Um, and if you look at it, I mean, all the integrations in, in the Solana ecosystem, they're coming up to a count of 368. But with a layer one uh, project like this, uh, by the way, for those of you who are not super familiar with Solana, Solana does some... It's uh, some really interesting stuff. It's one of the one of the bigger uh, cap um, kind of uh, altcoins at this point. Uh, it's not one of the big three at this point. Cardano is in the big three. Um, big moves with their price action since I last uh, talked. We'll go over that um, another time. But Solana is now you know in the top five, in the top five now. Um, so really, really impressive. Behind that is going to be that Polkadot, Dogecoin, some of the other big well-known ones. Avalanche is really kicking off, but. Um, Solana does a thing where it's like, um, remember the structure of a blockchain I was going over in that first video, uh, that the cryptocurrency one? Um, one thing that's not in the structure of each individual block, uh, if you notice, was time. There's no timestamps for these the, for that stuff. So uh, Solana had the somehow revolutionary idea of just you know marking the time of transaction. And that's allowed for a lot of extra capabilities. And not only that, but it has 50,000 TPS, which is 
ridiculous, right? And so one thing about the TPS thing, you know, yeah, Bitcoin really only has, you know, less than a dozen TPS. It's not very good on that front. Ethereum has a little bit more, but not much more. Algorand has a good bit more, but I think only in the hundreds. Um, and then, then comes Solana with 50,000. To put that into perspective, things like MasterCard Visa, we have like, you know, I think it was like set five, 7,000 I had it in my first video. Not nearly 50,000, right? So Solana has that. They have uh, good fundamentals from that perspective. Um, if you look at their, you know, ecosystem, they're becoming a really big NFT play these days. They're, they're doing massive, uh, massive business in terms of NFT, uh, you know, trading volume. And a lot of this stuff is, um, so if you look at, you know, so out of these 368, uh, 74 NFT plays, right? 74, that is more than everything else on this uh, types of integrations. So that is like kind of the dominant use case right now of, um, uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, Solana's ecosystem. One thing that you will notice is that if you go through this stuff, this is a layer one project, right? So it has to build an ecosystem essentially from scratch. Um, compare this, right? So looking through all this, you recognize things like Phantom. Uh, you you might recognize, you know, some of these other, whatever. If you're into certain tokens, there's, there's integrations with all this stuff. Um, uh, but if you compare this with Ethereum's, um, you know, Enterprise Alliance, uh, it's it's not even it's not even close, right? Um, just just look at this, right? You reckon if you go to this, you only recognize certain names here. We recognized Phantom a little earlier, um, and then if you happen to be into some of these, yeah, I think Huobi's on here somewhere down uh, down there. So there's a couple, yeah. Here we go, Huobi. Um, but outside of, you know, exchanges like Huobi and then further down, you know, Coinbase somewhere. Exchanges, you know, that doesn't, that helps the price for sure. It helps get exposure, but it's not necessarily like a huge change in fundamentals. Go here to Ethereum, right? This is another layer one, and this is the uh, arguably the dominant competitor in the same space. If you go here, um, you will actually start to, you know, recognize some of these names. Um, so. Uh, what you saw Chainlink is on here. We'll talk about that shortly. They, they recently integrated with Chainlink. So I think that's super bullish for both Chainlink and Ethereum. But we got Ernst and Rung, Young. We got FedEx. Uh, what else? Um, JP Morgan, the bank. You know what I mean? Um, uh, we got uh, what? Microsoft? Friggin' Microsoft, right? Like that's, that's really impressive. We got Polygon. We'll talk about them shortly. Um, you know, runtime verification. Inc. That's another company you probably have seen a lot, but never really thought about it. Um, and a lot of these, right? VMware. You've probably seen that as well. Um, so, so pretty a much more uh, interesting and you know well-known bunch of members uh, in this particular ecosystem. This this is this is a lot more. You know, this is what layer one blockchains are going to look like when they're a bit more mature. Right when they start to get um, more and more adoption, and it's interesting types of adoption, right? Seeing who's uh, getting into it. The Bank of New York Mellon. I mean, having all these banks and stuff in there um, is really uh, encouraging for Ethereum. Solana isn't quite there yet, but any one of these could end up blowing up to make Solana, you know, the go-to place for whatever. Um, they're really going and doing that for an NFT plays, Twitch. NFT integrated uh, social network that could, you know, maybe that'll be another Twitch, which I believe is the point of the name there. Um, and then, you know, what else? Uh, Solamas. Anyway, that's that's Solana. Super, super bullish. We'll see how much they get to with this bull run. They've already performed ridiculously well. I'm I'm really hesitant about even like putting a price out there because who the hell knows? Solana hasn't been following the rules at all. They've just been going up. And then the market goes up, down and then Solana goes up, market goes down, Solana goes up, market goes up, Solana goes up, doesn't matter. Um, they've just been crushing it. They've been utterly crushing it. I'm like really bullish on Solana. I mean, you can't argue with results when it comes right down to it. Another huge one. Um, so once again, we talked about in my first update in the initial video, Oracle, Oracle plays, right? Chainlink remains by far and away the dominant Oracle play. They're the head of the space, straight up. No, you know, no, uh, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
Um, they're the head of the uh, Oracle play. Nobody has stronger Oracle plays than um, Chainlink. And actually, you can look at their momentum. Look at this, right? In 2017, you had two integrations, then you had 21, then you had 103, and then you had 214. And now, just this year to date, we have two more months left. To date, we, just, we have 471 just this year, right? And total 839. They're growing at like an exponential place. It's really impressive. And because they're an Oracle play, if you look through their ecosystem, you can kind of judge it a little bit differently, right? As a layer one, because you have to build up your own ecosystem, um, you probably don't start with the same level of you know support and adding certain things doesn't necessarily mean as much for a layer one than you know like an oracle play everything here for uh you know for an oracle counts a lot like if you go to solana and you see that they have you know an integration with say cardano there um that wouldn't be as bullish in my perspective as it would be seeing cardano here uh for chainlink just because all of these integrations matter, right? I think the network effect of Oracle plays is even bigger than, uh, or more important to their you know, basic survival and function than with layer ones. So just because you know, anything that uses them uh, you know, would have the same kind of Oracle play as anything else that uses them. So you, interacting with them to kind of either dApps or layer ones, whatever's on there integrated, uh, would probably be easier um, and, and just simpler from a developer perspective if everybody's just using the Chainlink uh, Oracle. Um, <clears throat> and of course, um, there's a lot of function to the Chainlink Oracle there. You know, there's verifiable randomness and stuff like that. They're doing a lot of different stuff. Um, verifiable randomness, having an application towards gambling, actually. Um, uh, but if you go through here, I mean, everything here is a huge plus for chain, just directly good. You know, Cardano, obviously that's huge. Cardano has their own Oracle plays, but because Chainlink is so big, it just makes sense to integrate with them. It just makes sense. You know, it just makes sense. Um, and then they have some kind of bigger uh, names in their uh, ecosystem as well. But as much as that is, you know, helpful to have bigger names, Chainlink as an Oracle, I think is just, you know, having more is also just really important. Open Ocean, that's an NFT uh, uh, product there, the KuCoin Launchpad. Um, uh, there's actually a couple of others on here that were kind of um, kind of notable. Um, some Ethereum projects, some Polkadot projects, um, some Solana projects. We got, we got a lot on here. AccuWeather, um, that's kind of, that's one that you probably have seen. Um, Ferrum Network, Coin Metrics. There's there's a lot of really interesting projects on here, and some really big projects on here. I believe Zillica's on there. Um, so yeah, yeah, Chainlink looking really bullish, looking really bullish. I don't think you can go wrong long term with Chainlink. This is another one of those kind of bigger um, mid to large cap uh, coins that I think you should really keep an eye on. This is really good stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Chainlink, almost self-explanatory what their value is. It's really good stuff. Polygon, also pretty impressive. I think uh, their their stats speak for themselves, right? Right now, Maddox price is just over $1. I think that's a huge discount. Um, so I've bought more recently. Uh, they have over 660,000 uh, wallet addresses. What, 7.5 million transactions per day uh, with 100 active validators and almost $2 million of staked Matic token. And if you look at their, you know, their interaction fees, I mean, look at that, not even comparable, right? Not even comparable, not even close, right? The swaps, NFT transfer, ETH transfer, adding liquidity, um, fractions of a single penny. Literally not one of these costs even a single penny. That is a very usable um, network right there. Very usable and you know, I couldn't find it for this video. I'll look for it a little bit more, but their integrations are going wild as well. They're they're getting locked into everything. And remember, Polygon is a technology that can, is a layer two scaling solution that is layer one agnostic. Primarily, if you look at their materials, obviously they're talking about ETH, Ethereum for the most part, but they're on a bunch of blockchains. They can support things like, you know, verified randomness for, for casinos and shit like that. They, that's some of their projects that they're doing. Okay, so Polygon, Super cool. 
uh, from my native India. You know, we'll we'll see. We'll, we're hoping that they do pretty well. And I think because of that kind of Indians can be a little culturally insulated and they're very into their own shit. If they, you know, hear that this is from Indians and it's in India and it supports, you know, people in India, they'll get, I think they'll get really into it. Uh, almost over Ethereum or, or Bitcoin, which I don't necessarily think is super justified, but I think uh, Polygon is a really, really valuable project, especially because they are kind of uh, agnostic of layer one. So that's, that's Polygon. What else we got here? So we got, where the heck is it? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, so we got Luna. That's the kind of the last thing. I'm a huge fan of, of Luna. Um, oh wait, we skipped right over Axie Infinity, God damn it. Axie Infinity, 46% today. Holy Jesus Christ, 46%? God damn it. So they were 30% earlier, like an hour or two ago. Very, very impressive, 46%. Wow, I should have bought more of them. Uh, but they are not just an interesting project, but a really interesting idea in general, as far as blockchain pay for play games. Um, so this is huge, right? So in the Philippines, for instance, is where a lot of their players come from. Uh, a lot of these impoverished companies, I believe it's Malaysia and the Philippines and stuff like that, that, that are their biggest users. Um, but literally it is what it sounds like. I mean, you know, pay for play has a lot of, I think, potential. Not only is it just being, you know, providing pathways out of poverty, um, which is nuts, um, but it, not, it, it actually provides an income that is potentially, you know, really life-changing for a lot of the people that actually use it, right? So if you see uh, like a testimonial there, at first I just wanted to try its legitimacy. And after a week of playing, I was amazed by it with my first income. So he got $206 in one week, uh, and he often apparently gets something like $300 or something per week, which to any of us, you know, that's less than two hours of work for me. But I mean, that's uh, that's in the Philippines. I mean, that's that's a good amount of money. That's life changing for them on top of what they're already earning. Uh, although, I mean, apparently he was playing uh, around the clock, so that might not be too sustainable. I don't know. But now his his, his neighbors and his 66 year old grandmother are playing too. So, I mean, the fact that a 66 year old grandmother can get into it means that it's easy to use. The fact that it's a game means that even children would be happy to use it. I mean, there's a lot to be bullish about for pay for play uh, blockchain and, and games and stuff. Now, on Axie Infinity specifically, I mean, the biggest drawback to Axie is that it's not particularly fun at the moment. Um, I believe they have some plans to add extra gaming features going forward to keep people interested, but. I think if you're going to do pay for play blockchain and crypto, you know, NFT games uh, long term, it's got to be fun. Like long term, it's got to be fun. Um, straight up, is it, that that's going to be the edge that gives the next leading NFT game, uh, you know, the biggest uh, price action and adoption, I think, is if it's fun. If they come up with a thing that functions really well, especially for poor people and stuff like Axie Infinity, um, that's kind of accessible. Uh, and fun. I think that's going to be the big thing that makes the difference. Yeah, if you can get a fun pay-for-play game that people want to play around the clock instead of just trying to get an income because they need to eat, you know, um, that would be huge. Like even even not poor people will start playing it, you know, and that'll be good for everybody uh, with that kind of adoption. Um, but this is a big uh, kind of NFT gaming play. Uh, there's other things like Illuvium and stuff like that that are coming up that uh, in the same space that I think are going to be potentially huge um, because they're kind of, I think that's kind of what people are working on is trying to bring NFT games that element of fun um, because that's really going to be pivotal, I think, going forward. Um, and then, you know, Wrapped Luna, I said we'd talk about that briefly. So Wrapped Luna is on Coinbase to kind of uh, anticipate and potentially circumvent some type of, uh, you know, regulatory issues more than anything. That's why it's Wrapped as opposed to the actual uh, Luna uh, on Coinbase, uh, because Coinbase is kind of going through this thing with regulators right now where the SEC is like being mean to them or whatever because they wanted to open up this lending program and they were like oh this is security you can't do it well other people do it why are you singling us out i don't think we have a clear answer on that particular saga just yet but you know there's this whole twitter beef um with coinbase's ceo 
We'll see how that plays out. But right now, I think with Luna, they're just keeping it wrapped. So wrapped Luna is an ERC-20 token um, that kind of aims to replicate the price action of Luna. Luna is interesting because it is a coin in the Terra ecosystem that is burned and minted to maintain the uh, peg of Terra USD, which is a stable coin just like DAI or USDC um, that uh, is, is maintained that way, using Luna as kind of this kind of backup reserve that um, kind of helps maintain its value. If, if, if the value of um, that Terra USD goes down, you just burn some Luna and that um, increases the price because it's pegged to it. Um, and then if the price goes up, you just mint a little Luna and then you know, that fixes the price. Um, and, and Luna has really been blowing up lately as well. So, I mean, that's, that's the other thing uh, that kind of brought it to my attention, to be honest. Um, it's, it's price action, you know, in the last year, August, it was $13. Now we're all the way up to 37 with a uh, high of 43. Um, and you know, that's, that's pretty good since, since it was listed, it, it went up a large amount, a large amount. So, so Luna is just something to keep an eye on. Admittedly, it's not my strongest conviction. Uh, it, I'm just kind of, I kind of got on the bandwagon to be honest. Um, it was just. You know, I didn't. I didn't go too heavy into it. Just like maybe three hundred dollars less than that, I think. Um, but it's 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 kind of bordering into that realm of my weaker convictions, like Ethereum Classic, Decentraland, Tezos. Tezos actually has decent technology. Polkadot has excellent technology. Um, but you know, I, I they're not my biggest horses in the races. In the race, um, that's going to be mainly like things like Algorand, Solana, Ethereum, and Cardano. One thing you don't see in here a lot is Cardano. Have I sold all my Cardano? No, no, I have not. Uh, I have about 2,100 Cardano in my Uroi wallet. Um, and, you know, Cardano is, is is killing it right now. Cardano is absolutely crushing the market. They're at 224, $71 billion market cap. Um, they had a recent run up all the way to, I believe, $3.10, which I believe is an all time high for them. Yeah, 310. 310. So we have we have a good all-time high on Cardano these days. Um, super bullish on them. Super bullish. Their project Africa is awesome. At this point, they have uh, come out with smart contracts. We are officially in the Gokin era. We have come to the fruition of all you know having smart contracts on Cardano. We're getting a lot of projects into uh, into you know mobility and then function. Um, Cardano is getting this really you know it has a growing NFT marketplace. And then as far as its DeFi applications, I think that's going to go, go buck wild now that we actually have smart contracts. Um, so I think Cardano could potentially see some almost um, almost Solana-esque price action. And in a way, it almost already has. Like if you look at um, since January, right? Back in January, we were at 30 cent Cardano, which I can barely believe, which means that at the top here, if you, you know, you had a, you had a easel, easily like a 10x opportunity there, 10x plus. Um, and if you were just a little earlier, at, you know, back when it was you know, a couple teen cents, I mean, that's that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, so, but I don't think we're done here. I don't think we're done here at all. There's too much bullish stuff going on as far as, you know, Project Africa, you know, Gogan being introduced, all the uh, dApps being brought into actual function um, and the growing NFT plays. I mean... Cardano, I think we have. I think we have a lot of room to run on Cardano. I think we have a lot of room to run. I mean, when it comes to this cycle, whether this cycle is just you know the end of the year, because Q4 is going to be huge. I think for cryptocurrency in general, Q4 should be big because this is um, the end of that four-year, you know, the traditional four-year cycle. Uh, whether we go into a super cycle, you know, fingers crossed, but who knows? Who knows? It would be a huge break with the trend. It would be not something that would be easy to predict, honestly. We could see another crypto winter, but there's so many bullish things happening with so many of these projects. Maybe the bull f cycle gets extended a little bit this time. Maybe that's what we see. But at least in the near future, at least until December, January, I'd be shocked to see another like 90% uh, correction of like, you know, straight up into a crypto winter. That may well happen again in the near future. You know, it's cryptocurrency. You can't really, you know, count on steadiness there's that volatility and you know it's serious volatility we're talking like 90 percent um losses easily 90 percent 
right? Easily 90%. And so if, if I'm at 20,000 and I uh, lose 90%, I'm down to like 2,000. Um, but I hope that happens. If I'm being totally honest with you, I hope that happens. Because these projects, I'm not gonna, if it happened with these smaller coins, you know, I'm not gonna put any more money into them, obviously. Um, but the bigger convictions here, I will DCA hard into them if, it, if we get a 90%. Because that what's gonna happen in the next four years, right? If I could buy Bitcoin at, at like, you know, $4,000, get out of here. Like, whatever, man. Like, the next cycle, in the next four years, that would be nuts. That would be nuts. And so, obviously, we're getting all this interest from Coinbase. That's the last thing you mentioned is that we're getting some stuff in real time. There. That's, that's really, um, that's cool. You know, I'm trying to get more and more Ethereum staking just because uh, I'm really bullish on Ethereum. And it's the highest APY on Coinbase, which has got to do a little something, something for the price action. Cool thing is that it's on Coinbase. You know, once we get FOMO from Bitcoin's big run, which may be coming soon, um, uh, easier access is going to be a big deal. More retail FOMO is going to happen. And now that Robinhood is announcing, I mean, they've been announcing, they've been saying this for years, but they announced that, you know, they want to be, you know, a fully non-custodial uh, crypto exchange kind of setup. So they'll let you have your own keys. That would be really cool. That would be really bullish. And I think once the FOMO comes and really Bitcoin and other tokens start to go parabolic this cycle, um, and Solana's like, speak for yourself, I'm already parabolic. But once that really starts happening for the market as a whole, um, you know, I think that's gonna be big, having that easy retail investor access. Um, so that's cool. That's where we're at. So, you know, we're, we're doing really well in terms of, you know, crypto portfolio growth. You know, once we got the new job and started DCAing larger amounts, that's really what this slope that you're seeing here is. It's it's more a reflection of my income than it is anything else. But I mean, this is not a reflection of my income. This happened instantaneously in a couple of minutes. So hopefully we see more like that. And hopefully we see more of like a parabolic marketplace there. That's gonna be exciting. Um, but you know, if it takes a little longer or if we even go into a little bit of a bear market, um, that's also exciting for different reasons. It gives you a chance to get discounts on everything that you like. Uh, as long as you're, you know, strong conviction, strong fundamentals. Don't, you know, go around chasing shit coins when everything's bad. Um, but, uh, you know, that's not financial advice. You do your own research, you do your thing. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, so if you want more like this, please like and subscribe. If you like the video, don't forget to drop a like. If you didn't, dislike. Um, and uh, next video is going to be on COVID-19. We're going to do a little update on that as well. All right, so thanks for tuning in.